Welcome to the Unity in Humanity Interfaith Celebration 2023. We are so happy to have you joining us to listen to this year's speakers. I'm here in Delaware and our presenters will be joining us from Utah, Colorado and Washington DC and California. I think this is such a great opportunity to gather together from across the country in the comfort of our own homes and engage in the dialogue as these speakers share with us the treasures and the perspectives from their culture, religion, relationships with divine and spiritual path they have chosen in this life. This year's theme is sacred beliefs and holy writings. I have also offered for any of the pre presenters who have any thoughts to share in the eclipse. That eclipse is gonna be taking place in about 30 minutes. It will be interesting to see what some of the thoughts might include. The Crow Indian tribe in Montana, where I was born and raised, believes that it signifies a new beginning, that the sun dies and is rejuvenated. Another perspective on this sacred natural phenomenon I have come across is from the Navajo tribe. The belief is that the sun is male and the moon is female. The eclipse signifies the mating of the two. And after the passing of the eclipse, believe a birthing has just taken place. In this process, the universe and all creation are reborn, realigned, and there is growth and development amongst all of creation as well. It is also a time of fasting, and I've heard that actually there's a lot of people today fasting for peace in the Middle East. Okay, um, feel free to ask your questions in the question box only with questions for the current speakers during their presentations. All participants are muted except for the speakers. Um, and there is a time for question and answers at the end of each talk. The chat box is also available for anyone who would like to use it. There are a lot of differing beliefs being shared. Let's let our hearts be full of charity and become one in peace and friendship. Please be sure to use the chat box respectfully. The speaker lineup is as follows. The opening prayer will be given by our first presenter, Hari Kirtana Das, followed by Danny Hall, Reverend Marquita Oliver, Brian and Jennifer Bowler, and Denver C. Snuffer Jr., with the closing prayer being given by Jennifer Bowler. With all that said, let's begin with our first guest, Hari Kirtana Das. Hari Kirtana Das is a bhakti yogi, author and teacher who guides people on journeys of self-discovery and personal transformation. A lifelong student of theistic yoga philosophy, Hari Kirtana has lived in the yoga ashrams and intentional communities, worked for Fortune 500 companies and Silicon Valley startups, and brings a wide range of scriptural knowledge and life experience to his classes, workshops, and courses. He's a frequent contributor to forums and magazines about the enduring relevance of yoga's ancient wisdom to life in the modern world. You can learn more about Hari by visiting his website, harikirtana.com. I was able to participate in his brilliant three-part online class with commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, ancient text and modern application. He offers a free Zoom discussion each month, which I have had the pleasure to participate in. I'm also excited about his forthcoming book about the Bhagavad Gita due out this spring. Please join us in prayer with our first speaker. Welcome, Hari. Thanks for joining in from DC. And thank you also for getting this discussion started off with a prayer. Jill, thank you very, very much for inviting me to participate in this seminar or symposium. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, and a pleasure to be sharing this platform with my fellow panelists. I'll begin with a prayer from the Srimad Bhagavatam, which I think is uh, very timely. I'll chant the Sanskrit and then share the translation with you. This prayer goes like this. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Narasinghaya Svastyastu Vishvasya Kala Prasidatam Jayantu Bhutani Shivam Mito Diya Manascha Bhadram Bhajata Dadhokshaje Avishyatam No Matir Apya Haituki 
May there be good fortune throughout the universe, and may all who are envious be pacified. May all living beings find peace through the practice of bhakti yoga, for by accepting devotional service, they will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let our minds always remain absorbed in meditation on the transcendental personality of Godhead, and let us always serve the Supreme Lord without any ulterior motive. So I'll explain a little bit about my particular form of faith, bhakti yoga, through a little bit of commentary on this prayer. Bhakti yoga means union with the transcendental supreme being through devotional service. Bhakti is often translated as devotion, which implies a feeling, a sentiment. The sages in my particular lineage called uh, Chaitanya Vaishnavism, uh, worship of Vishnu or Krishna, devotion to uh, Krishna as uh, explained and understood by the, the great sage Chaitanya, who appeared uh, at the end of the 15th century and taught into the beginning of the 16th translates bhakti as something active, devotional service, not just the feeling of devotion, but love expressed through action. And in this prayer, uh, the speaker named Prahlad Maharaj, one of the great devotees of Vishnu, who is understood to be expert in the theory and practice of devotional yoga, recommends that devotional service to the one supreme source of everything is a means by which we can come to think of each other's welfare. The reason for this is because the conception of the absolute truth in this way of thinking is that of a complete whole, an infinite and complete whole of which we are all infinitesimal parts. And when we see one another as infinitesimal parts of the same complete whole, there is a sense of spiritual kinship not just with all human beings, but with all beings. And therefore, that sense of unity through the central element that connects us all provides impetus for compassion, for empathy, for wishing well uh, to all living beings. This is also a prescription for personal peace, for our own individual peace. Uh, and this prayer is um, particularly directed to a form of Vishnu called Narasimha. So the, the very first part of the prayer, Om Namo Bhagavate uh, Narasimhaya, unto Nara Singha, uh, uh, unto Nara Singha. So Singha means lion, Nara means man. So this is an avatar, meaning uh, one who descends, uh, in colloquial terms, an incarnation of Vishnu, who appears as a half man, half lion, and appears specifically for the sake of protecting his devotees. And there is, of course, the element of external protection, protection from outside forces or influences, but there's also the element of inner protection. That is to say, uh, protection from 
my own propensity for selfishness, for pride, uh, for uh, gratuitous sensuality beyond that which is uh, healthy, especially healthy for the pursuit of spiritual life. Um, so requesting this particular incarnation of Vishnu to reside within my own heart uh, and uh, be the object of my meditation, be the destroyer of all of my own inner obstacles to spiritual advancement uh, is part of actually the daily practice of Krishna Bhakti in the Chaitanya Vaishnava tradition. So what I'd like to do is share a little bit of how I personally came to this spiritual tradition, uh, how I uh, developed my understanding of what this tradition involves, what its goals are, uh, what my spiritual practice consists now consists of, how I came to that, and then a little bit of background on the theistic philosophy that we find in the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam, also known as the Bhagavad Purana, which is the book in which we find the prayer that I just recited for you. If at any time you have a uh, question or a comment, something you'd like to share, please go ahead and uh, enter that into the Q&A window, and I will stop periodically just to see what, if anything, we have there. I'd be happy to respond to your questions, and then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for final questions to wrap things up. So my name, Hari Kirtan Das, is a Sanskrit name that was given to me in 1978 when I took a formal initiation into the tradition of Chaitanya Vaishnavism. Uh, it was given to me in a formal ceremony by my Diksha guru. Uh, and it means uh, the servant of the chanting of the names of Hari. And the name Hari indicates one who removes obstacles on the path of devotional yoga. It, uh, so it translates into something very long. In English, Sanskrit is a very compressed language. Fortunately, I do not have to sign my name in English on checks anymore uh, because we have you know, electronic ways of doing these things. Save me a lot of ink. I began reading the Bhagavad Gita when I was in high school and I did not understand it. Um, but I felt an attraction to it. So I tried reading it a few more times and the third time, well, actually, the, the second, first time, I just didn't understand it at all. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. The second time I read it, I got the idea that it was about religion, and I was looking for yoga. And so, uh, you know, I, I let it go. But I still felt an attraction. And the third time I read the Bhagavad Gita, I did so as part of a group study while living in a devotional yoga ashram in New York City. And studying with a group and hearing from experienced teachers, and also because I was living in an intentional spiritual community, trying to live the teachings I was studying, that made all the difference. And I felt like I had a much better grasp on the idea that yoga and religion were not contradictory. In fact, that the words in a way were synonyms. If we look at the Latin root of the word religion, religio, again, to connect. And one of the meanings of yoga is connection based on the uh, Sanskrit root yuj. Uh, as in yoke, to uh, be connected through a dynamic element of connection. 
So I came to understand bhakti yoga as the science of creating an existential condition within myself that was conducive to religious experience, not so much a religion as we understand individual religions, individual faith forms, but rather a science that existed in a universal sense, uh, in a sense of being independent from any particular form of faith. And what attracted me to the idea was the soundness and completeness of a theological philosophy. At first, when I first read the Bhagavad Gita, I rejected the teachings on the basis that it seemed to be promoting uh, a personal conception of a supreme being. And I was correct, it was. But I was attracted to it because it confirmed something that I had thought on my own when I was even younger. The idea that I myself and all other people were forms of energy and that the law of conservation of energy tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Therefore, I reasoned that I must be invincible in some form or fashion, that there was some element of myself, my consciousness, that never came into being and could not possibly go out of being, even though I was currently in this container, this material body. And the first instructive verse of the Bhagavad Gita confirms individual existence on a spiritual level, which is to say an eternal level. That verse is the second, uh, is in the second chapter, the 12th verse. It never was there Krishna speaking to Arjuna, his friend and a warrior on a battlefield, faced with the prospect of having to fight a battle he really doesn't want to fight. Uh, turns to Krishna and asks for advice. What course of action will serve the greatest good under the circumstances? And Krishna gives Arjuna a baseline teaching upon which the rest of the Bhagavad Gita is based. And that baseline teaching is never was there a time when I, Krishna, did not exist, nor you, Arjuna, did not exist, nor all these kings assembled on the battlefield, in other words, everybody else in the world, uh, did not exist, nor in the future is there any possibility that any of us will cease to be. So this is a validation of our experience of individual existence. And the rest of the Gita goes on to give what I felt was a pretty coherent explanation for how we experience ourselves and, and how we experience the world. The part I had trouble with was the idea that Krishna occupied the position of God. In the, fir in the first reading, I, was, I felt, oh, I'm, I'm being asked to believe that a little blue flute playing cowherd boy is the supreme being. And that seemed a little far-fetched. It so sounded to me like it was kind of in the same knowledge category as uh, the universe was created by a school of cosmic dolphins or something. However, in due course of time, I, f by, by virtue of group study of the sacred text in the wisdom tradition of bhakti yoga in this particular lineage, I came to the conclusion that there was a very coherent 
philosophy that made sense of this ultimate conclusion about Krishna being the personality of Godhead, meaning the, the personality of that from which the qualities of Godness uh, arise. I referenced soundness and completeness before. Um, so soundness means no internal contradictions. The, the philosophy uh, does not chase its tail in any way or have any unresolvable problems or come up with something that is inexpressible. And then completeness means can be practically applied in all relevant circumstances. There was also the element of practice confirming theory. In other words, it was scientific. It was not just a matter of faith, but there was an experiment that you could do to test the theory. And that was sadhana, spiritual practice. So I adopted the spiritual practice. And by my own personal experience, uh, doing this kind of subjective experiment, I found that uh, the theory seemed to hold. So that's how I came to this uh, particular path of spirituality. The path itself is articulated by the disciples of Sri Chaitanya, who I mentioned earlier, appears uh, at the end of the 15th through the very beginning of the uh, 16th century. So this is a medieval theology developed on the basis of much older wisdom texts, the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, the Bhagavatam or the Bhagavad Purana is something we understand to be a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra also known as the Brahma Sutra. The Vedanta Sutra is uh, a set of codified instructions through which one understands the philosophical conclusions of the Upanishads and the Upanishads are the philosophical portion of the Vedas. So we work our way all the way back to the Vedas and the philosophical portions of the Vedas known as the Upanishads. So these are all commentaries and elaborations or interpretations of Upanishadic teaching. So very ancient stuff uh, that is systematized and formalized in its uh, literature from around the uh, 16th century forward. And it's something that's not frozen. It's not uh, we often hear yoga is a 5,000 year old practice or philosophy, but it is not something that's been fossilized. It's not something that's static. Um, my practice feels like participation in a dynamic, evolving tradition. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Srimad Bhagavatam in particular, is that the Bhagavatam makes a distinction between the concept of the absolute truth and the concept of God. And this was something that I found to be particularly attractive, uh, because the concept of God that I grew up with as a Western born person in a predominantly Christian society uh, I was raised Jewish, uh, and therefore I was familiar with the Abrahamic traditions and the concept of a creator God that went with that. Uh, and I decided relatively young that I, I was going to look elsewhere for my own spiritual path. And I came upon this teaching in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which introduces the idea that God as creator is a position. 
And there's a person who is uniquely qualified to occupy this position. We hear about this also in the Yoga Sutras, where Patanjali refers to Ishvara as uh, Purusha Vishesha, a person, but a special person, unique, categorically different kind of person, not like us. And therefore, because the absolute truth is described in one of the Upanishads, the Isha Upanishad, as being complete, the attribute of personness is also present in this absolute truth. And this makes sense insofar as our own personness is derived from the source of our being. Uh, the Vedanta Sutra begins with the aphorism, Atato Brahma Jigyasa Janna Yasya Yataha. Uh, now, as all sutras begin with now, uh, try to understand Brahman, and Brahman is defined as that from which all things proceed. Therefore, logically, the attribute of personness must be present in Brahman in order for us to have the experience of personness, because everything uh, originates in Brahman. This also includes language. And it is by hearing that we begin this reconnection, religio, with the personal aspect of the absolute truth. There are um, four principal uh, uh, practices of bhakti yoga in my tradition, hearing being the first. So we hear from sources of wisdom. Uh, then the second is chanting or glorification. In all traditions, in all theistic traditions, we uh, hear that the name of God is holy. What makes this name holy? The non-difference of the name from the person who is being named. In other words, the sound vibration of the Supreme Being is understood in Bhakti Yoga to be non-different from the person. Therefore, to chant the names of the Supreme Being is to associate directly with the Supreme Being and the purifying uh, effect of that association elevates the consciousness and cleanses the heart of all of the dust that has accumulated uh, on the mirror of the mind, so as to obscure our view of ourselves as we truly are in our eternal spiritual condition. Then, after chanting, remembering, looking at the world through the lens of scriptural wisdom in order to see the divine nature of the world and the source of the world, the divine source of the world within the world. So another element of this completeness is the idea that uh, the supreme person taking the position of creator is the source of the world, but is also within the world and is non-different from the world there is a simultaneous oneness and difference between the supreme being and the supreme being's energies of which this entire uh, cosmic manifestation is an emanation the energies are divided into uh, material and spiritual that is to say uh, Bhakti Yoga in the Chaitanya Vaishnava tradition incorporates elements of Sankhya, which means enumeration of elements, particularly the enumeration of material elements and the distinction between matter and spirit. And Vedanta, Veda means knowledge, Anta means end, so Vedanta means the ultimate conclusion of knowledge, which is knowledge of Brahman or transcendence. Um, and that transcendence 
is understood to have three features called Brahman, the undifferentiated oneness of being, the, sub, the spiritual substrata of reality. Param Atma, so Atma, the individual soul, consciousness, Param, paramount, uh, supreme, so universal consciousness, that consciousness which is localized within the heart of all beings and within each subatomic particle of matter and is universal. The explanation for how one subatomic particle at one end of the universe knows what another subatomic particle at the other end of the universe is doing in real time. Astrophysicists take note. Um, and then finally, Bhagavan, meaning the uh, personal form of the absolute truth. And the energies of this absolute truth divided into matter and spirit um, we find delineated as earth, water, fire, air, ether, in modern parlance, uh, solids, liquids, gases. Um, oh no, uh, earth, solids, water, liquids, fire, um, radiance, uh, then gases, and then space. And then also mind, intelligence, and ego, as well as the life force, prana. These are all in the category of matter. And then beyond that is what is regarded as a superior energy. And this is described in the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the living beings, you and I, who engage with this, uh, with these material elements. And then beyond that, the source of both of these divisions of energy, the uh, supreme being. So seeing the divine nature of the world and the source of the world within the world is part of remembering. And then serving is the fourth practice of bhakti yoga, uh, actively engaging in becoming an instrument of divine will, inquiring as to how one can be of service to the highest truth. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, that highest truth is defined as uh, reality distinguished from illusion for the benefit of all. Um, so my role in being of service to the highest truth, as I understand it, is to be a teacher. Uh, I am a mentor to uh, individuals uh, as we walk together on the path of spiritual understanding. Uh, and as Jill mentioned at the top of the uh, introduction that she so kindly gave me, um, I offer community conversations and courses and such like that in order to share uh, my understanding and realization of the teachings that I have been so fortunate to receive. I think that is a sufficient general explanation of what my spiritual path consists of and how I came to it. And if we have some questions uh, in the Q&A or if there's something uh, in the chat. Jill, if you'd be kind enough to let me know what we have and I will be happy to reply. So <clears throat> there is something that came up in the chat. Can you see that, Hari? Oh, yes. Okay, I see uh, a couple of things. Um, it sounds uh, that you have found the wisdom text unfolds and reveals itself uh, the more it is read, studied, meditated on, and great worth is found in studying and practicing in a community. Um, yes, uh, I have found that I can read and reread the Bhagavad Gita over and over again, and every time there is something new there, there is something that speaks to me in my particular circumstance, uh, wherever I'm at in my life uh, at that particular moment. It is, uh, it has endless depth. 
The same can be said for the Srimad Bhagavatam, and even more so. Uh, it is a much bigger text. Uh, with its commentaries, it is the size of an encyclopedia uh, and constitutes a, a project of lifelong study, to be sure. Uh, and I find particularly studying uh, with a teacher and in a group where there can be conversation, where there can be dialogue about the meaning of the text uh, and its practical application. That uh, is a very, very powerful way to study it really in any spiritual tradition. Uh, not just in mine. Uh, the conversations that we can have uh, in satsang, in groups of people whose interest is in discovering and exploring the truth with a capital T, uh, have immeasurable value. And the cross-generational conversation that we have, where a tradition is explored and where needed renovated in order to retain the essence but adjust the variable details in order for the tradition to remain relevant and applicable uh, that's one of the things i meant by feeling like i'm part of a dynamic living spiritual tradition so yeah yeah i do believe that's uh, true Second comment, um, I find this fascinating, uh, particularly references to the lion. Just curious on your thoughts on any similarities or parallels or not between Krishna and Christ. Christ is also referenced as a lion in the book of Revelation. Additionally, there is a Buddhist prophecy of a future Buddha to come who is also associated with the lion or the symbol of the lion. Just curious. Um, I am not uh, enough of a general theologian to be able to get into uh, the specifics of the particular comparison to Christ as lion or uh, Buddhist prophecies uh, with uh, that kind of symbolism. What I can say is that in my own personal spiritual journey, I read at least some of the New Testament. Uh, and I and I also did not understand that I, I uh, had a lot of trouble wrapping my head around it. After I had engaged in a group study of the Bhagavad Gita and felt like I had a at least a, a beginner's solid understanding of devotional yoga. I went back and looked at the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, ignored a lot of the stories around those teachings, but just focused on the, his teachings and came to the conclusion that what he was teaching was the same thing, that this was bhakti yoga, the same uh, elements of renunciation of material life and the pursuit of happiness in the material world were all there. The emphasis on uh, surrender uh, to a supreme deity, that was there. Um, all of it really was there. And I came to the conclusion that Jesus of Nazareth was a devotional yogi. Um, whereas, uh, Jesus was an emissary of his father uh, and expressed unity with God the Father. Uh, Krishna positions himself as the father, as the original source of uh, all creation. My Paramaguru, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, my grand guru, the guru of my guru, and the uh, principal teacher from whom my understanding of Chaitanya Vaishnavism or Krishna Bhakti comes, regarded Jesus as his guru, as an, ex uh, 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 an example of a pure devotee of God, someone who is willing to sacrifice everything uh, 
for the sake of being an instrument of divine will, which is to say, uh, to be on a, on a mission to reunite people with God and show people the path through which they can once again experience uh, a relationship of love between themselves and the source of their being. So that's, that's what I can offer you with uh, regard to uh, the relationship or the comparison between Krishna and Jesus Christ. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Hari. I enjoyed your presentation today. Something that stood out to me is this idea that one can chant, chant the holy name and that mm -hmm. it purifies us. Um, I think that that's, that's fascinating, especially given there are so many names, right, for the creator. So, Yes, and, and uh, the Bhakti Yoga tradition of which I am a part, in which I'm participating recognizes that there are innumerable names. In fact, there is an eight part instructional prayer that's also recited uh, in the morning uh, and that I utilize in my own uh, practice prior to uh, my mantra meditation practice, uh, which uh, I'll describe for just a moment. Um, that prayer, that portion of the prayer goes, uh, your holy name alone can render all benediction to living beings. And thus you have hundreds and millions of names like Krishna and Govinda, so many. Uh, so it's understood that uh, the benefit of chanting uh, Krishna's names or the names of the Supreme uh, are there in so many different forms. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also says, uh, you know, however one approaches me, I reciprocate with them in exactly that way. Everyone follows my path in all respects. So, so this idea of approachability from unlimited directions is there. Now, the direction I'm approaching from, uh, the practice, uh, the names that uh, I found uh, were, the, were the ones that resonated with me, which made Krishna my Ishta Devata, my form of God that I most relate to. Uh, the, the set of names in the mantra that I practice uh, are Hare, Krishna, and Rama, set in uh, a very symmetrical pattern of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And in the mornings, I uh, have beads, Japa beads, uh, and I uh, chant that mantra on each one of these beads and then proceed to the next bead and chant again until I get all the way around to the other end. And then I turn around and go back the other way. So that's the uh, essential individual practice of mantra meditation in the bhakti yoga tradition that I'm participating in. And then there's also a group uh, mantra meditation practice, kirtan, my name, uh, Hari Kirtan, Das, servant of the chanting, uh, implies congregational chanting, communal chanting, uh, a call and response uh, chanting of the mantra set to music. Uh, and this is uh, the way that um, in combination, japa purifies the heart and communal chanting kirtan purifies our relationships. Beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming today. Uh, I, I know you have to hop off for this wedding, but I appreciate you coming and sharing with us today. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate. And I'm looking forward to uh, accessing the replays later uh, in order to hear what uh, my fellow panelists have to say. I'm uh, always anxious to hear uh, about how uh, people find their spiritual paths and what those paths uh, comprise. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Danny 
Paul. He is the, the Director of Public Affairs for Soka Gakkai International, SGI USA, and is based in Washington, D.C., though he's joining us from California today. Uh, SGI USA is the most diverse Buddhist community in the United States and is part of a larger SGI network comprised of more than 12 million people in 192 countries and territories. SGI has a long history of working to eliminate nuclear weapons. Danny has assisted in the organization of several conferences dealing with the topic of reduction or elimination of nuclear arms. He has authored a number of works on this topic as well. He currently serves on the steering community of Back from the Brink, bringing communities together to abolish nuclear weapons. I have found some incredible beauty in what I have read um, in the Lotus Sutra, and I'm excited to hear him share more with us now um, and hear his declarations for peace, which are especially relevant today. Welcome, Danny. Thank you so much for joining us in this inner celebration, interface celebration. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting me and letting me be a part of this conversation. It's a real pleasure. Um, as Jill was saying, uh, uh, much of my work is dealing with uh, advocacy issues related to uh, peace and disarmament, but it's it's always uh, a real treat to be able to dive back into um, the faith basis for uh, our Nietzschean Buddhist uh, movement uh, for uh, creating value and working for a more peaceful world. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, share a more kind of a general overview of uh, Buddhism practiced within the Soka Gakkai Nichiren Buddhist tradition, um, focusing in on a few really important key concepts, and then uh, maybe talk a little bit about what it's like for me as an individual to practice uh, Soka Gakkai Nichiren Buddhism and how I got uh, involved and started on that path. Um, and I have some slides prepared, so I'm going to share my screen with everyone uh, to help uh, with my presentation. And you should be able to see it. So, uh, one of the first questions people ask when it comes to Buddhism is who or what is the Buddha? Um, Buddha uh, comes from the root word bud, uh, which is Sanskrit for opening a person's eyes or blooming of a flower. Um, it literally is translated as awaken one. Um, and it's also a word to describe uh, great Buddhist leaders and teachers throughout the history of the Buddhist tradition. Um, it's also used to describe a sort of non-material, in a sense, concept of Buddha, which is like this idea of universal Buddha or this uh, uh, fundamental law that permeates all phenomena uh, throughout the universe. Um, what did the Buddha awaken to? Um, one of the passages from Nichiren that I think helps uh, shed some light on this question is this. Um, if you wish to free yourself from the sufferings of birth and death, you have endured through eternity and attain supreme enlightenment in this lifetime. You must awaken to the mystic truth, which has always been within your life. So what is this mystic truth? It's understood in Buddhism as the Dharma or the law. Um, it describes, again, both the universal law that the Buddha awoke to and also the teachings he used to lead others to that awakening. It's also understood as the cosmic vitality from which all arises. Um, it's also the living, compassionate principle or wisdom that governs and supports the workings of all life. Now, uh, one of the most common questions that arises regarding Buddhism is whether there is a belief in God, or how do we understand God? Um, well, in fact, there is no specific reference to a monotheist God in any of the Buddhist literature. Uh, Buddhism has always been a very humanistic philosophy. Um, what we do have 
in Buddhism is the concept of the greater self and the lesser self, which shows how each life is a microcosmos operating in the context of a larger macrocosmos of the universe. And one way of describing uh, that is through the example of waves on the ocean. Waves appear from the ocean as the a result of such causes and conditions as wind, gravity, tides, the slope of the ocean floor, etc. And if we look at the wave shown here, we can see that there are differences that we can identify among them. Some are shorter, some are longer, some are more powerful than others, some have longer or shorter lifespans than others. But what is the one thing that we can say with certainty about every single wave? It is that they are all despite their differences, equally expressions of the ocean. And from a Buddhist perspective, it is the same thing with people. Um, Buddhism teaches that just as the ocean, in a sense, waves, the universe, in a sense, peoples. Uh, that is, in a sense, uh, expresses itself through all sorts of life. And while we may be very good at identifying the differences among these various expressions, such as categories of race, age, intellect, social class, party affiliation, um, we make a big mistake when we only identify something by its differences. It would be like defining a wave only by its relative size, strength, or appearance, and completely overlook the fact that it is the ocean itself. This identification of ourselves only by our relative identity, our social standing, our appearance, um, how cool people think we are, our grade point average, or how many followers we have on social media. This is what Buddhism would refer to as our ego or lesser self. The greater self is like the entire ocean of life. And Buddhism views our fundamental identity as being equal to the entire cosmos. This is the greater self. And according to Buddhism, people get into trouble when they have a deluded view of themselves, seeing themselves only in comparison to others, seeing only the differences. This leads to a deep sense of separation and suffering in life from the Buddhist perspective. It's like a wave that doesn't realize it's part of the ocean. We cut ourselves off not only from other people, but from the natural environment and from the depths of our own capability and resources. Buddhism views this uh, delusion of separation as the basic human problem to be addressed. And bridging the separation is the basic purpose of Buddhist practice. Buddhist practice aims to bridge this delusion, this separation, and create a profound dialogue between the particular lesser self and the eternal cosmos of the greater self. This practice is often taken the form of meditation in which the mind and its attachments are stilled to perceive this dharma or law that pervades our personal life and the life of the cosmos. But to achieve and maintain this level of contemplation is very difficult for many people, uh, especially amidst the complexities of modern life. And it's for this reason that in the Nichiren Buddhist tradition, uh, Nichiren crystallized this dharma or law into the mantra of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, which is an expression of the presence of the eternal Buddha nature in all life. For members of the Sokogaka and Nichiren Buddhist community, our daily practice of reciting the Lotus Sutra and chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is the process by which we redirect and revitalize the lesser self by reconnecting it with the very life of the cosmos. And I'll talk about this in a little more detail later. But it's uh, through this continuous effort at Buddhist practice that we come to bridge this gap and reintegrate the wave of the lesser self with the ocean of the cosmos, so to speak. Again, this is the basis for Nichiren Buddhism. So let me talk a little bit about Nichiren. Nichiren was a 13th century Japanese reformist teacher who established the form of Buddhism practiced by members of the Sokogakai Nichiren Buddhist community. Nichiren engaged in an exhaustive study of the various Buddhist sutras, treaties, and commentaries. He concluded that the heart of Shakyamuni, or uh, Siddhartha Gautama's enlightenment, 
is to be found in the Lotus Sutra. His interpretation of the Lotus Sutra emphasized the absolute equality of all people and that all people, regardless of superficial differences such as gender or social standing, can manifest the life state of a Buddha just as they are in this lifetime. Nichiren also came to the conclusion that the principle or law to which all Buddhas are enlightened is expressed in the phrase Nam Myoho Renge Kyo from the title or Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, the title is viewed not just as the title, but the essence and the experience of, of the enlightenment of the Buddha. Um, for Nichiren Buddhists, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is a simple, uh, an accessible spiritual practice to enable all people to tap into the Buddha nature and enter onto the path of Buddhist wisdom. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, Nichiren entered uh, uh, Kyosimuidera, uh, a temple in his hometown on the eastern coast of Japan at age 12 and was ordained there at the age of 16. He was motivated by an awareness of life's impermanence and a desire to escape the round of birth and death, that he desired to know which among the many sutras and rival schools represented the Buddha's true intention. Um, and he wished to resolve doubts about certain historical and political events that seemed to contradict Buddhist teachings. Um, so Nichiren engaged in this exhaustive study, uh, including those at Kamakura, the seat of military rule and the location of key temples under the government. Um, and after returning to Kiyomusudera at the age of 32, he gave a public presentation where he concluded that the heart of Shakyamuni's enlightenment is to uh, found in the Lotus Sutra. His interpretation of the Lotus Sutra emphasized the absolute equality of all people and that all people, just as they are, can manifest the state of life of a Buddha in this lifetime. Nichiren also came to the conclusion that the principle or law to which all Buddhas are enlightened is expressed in the phrase Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, from the title or Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. Many pre-Lotus Sutra schools of Buddhism taught that enlightenment was only accessible after an arduous process undertaken over unimaginably long periods of time, uh, over many lifetimes, in fact. In dramatic contrast, the Lotus Sutra explains that Buddhahood, oops, that Buddhahood or Buddha nature is already present in all life. The presence of Buddha nature in all life is the Buddhist basis for the equality of all people and the view that even within the life of a person apparently dominated by evil, there exists the Buddha nature. Um, there are, are uh, seven parables in the Lotus Sutra. One of them uh, that I think gets uh, at this idea effectively is called the, the jewel hidden in the robe. Uh, the gist of it is that there's a rich fan, friend, oops, sorry. There's a rich friend and a poor friend, and uh, they're having dinner one night. Uh, the poor friend uh, passes out. The rich friend while, uh, decides to take a precious gem and sew it into the lining of the poor friend's coat. Uh, the next morning, uh, the poor friend wakes up. He sees that his friend had disappeared, Oops! and he leaves. He goes on to live his life. He struggles uh, in many ways uh, financially. Uh, and never realizes until uh, many years later when he encounters his, fr his friend that this entire time he had this gem uh, sewn into the lining of his coat. And uh, some of the key messages of this parable are that we should not have ignorance in forgetting the supreme life condition of Buddhahood, and we should not be satisfied with lower states of life. Um, and if one cannot see the supreme jewel in another, uh, it means we can't really recognize it in ourselves either. And it's also a call to build a solid self. Um, so like finding uh, a diamond hidden in a robe or a lotus flower emerging from a muddy swamp, the goal of Nichiren Buddhist practice is to awaken and develop 
the Buddha nature in our lives. Uh, from uh, the Nichiren Buddha's perspective, we have to rediscover this jewel um, and other jewels again and again. Uh, Buddhahood is not a static condition or a final destination, uh, but is a uh, it's, uh, it's a dynamic journey of continual development and discovery. Um, it's the path of wisdom um, in which we continually strive to bring forth Buddha nature in our lives, become ruled less by our lesser self, dominated by greed, anger, and foolishness, um, known as the three poisons, and direct our lives based on our greater self, courage, wisdom, compassion, and vital life force. So the essence of the Lotus Sutra is the conviction that all people possess a Buddha nature, and as a result, possess the ability to transform suffering and overcome any problem or difficulty they may encounter in life. The logic for this assertion is based on the belief that the Buddha nature is kind of like a bridge uh, that makes individual lives inseparable from the fundamental law that underlies the workings of all life and the universe. Therefore, by tapping into one's Buddha nature, one simultaneously taps into and fuses one life with the wisdom underlying the workings of the entire universe. So how does one tap into the Buddha nature inherent in their life? Nichiren concluded that the mantra practice based on reciting the name of this law or principle provided a way for all people to activate um, within uh, their own lives an experience of the joy that comes from liberating oneself from the lesser self. That mantra is found in the title of the Lotus Sutra, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Uh, for Nichiren Buddhists, chanting the mantra Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is a vow, an expression of determination to embrace and manifest one's Buddha nature. It's a pledge to oneself to never yield to difficulties and to win over one's sufferings. And at the same time, it's a vow to help others reveal this law in their own lives and achieve happiness. Um, you can uh, roughly translate uh, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo uh, from the Sanskrit. Uh, Nam uh, comes from the Sanskrit namas, meaning to devote or dedicate oneself. Myoho, uh, is, myo means mystic or wonderful, or in a sense, difficult to comprehend. Uh, the idea that each life is an expression of the life of the universe, a wonder that people can transform their life and others at any time and in any circumstances, um, and transform life of unhappiness into supreme happiness. Ho refers to law, that this is a fundamental law of the universe that permeates all phenomena. Um, renge uh, literally translates as lotus flower. Uh, it's an important symbol in Buddhism. The lotus flower uh, blooms and seeds simultaneously. Uh, so it's sort of representative of this concept in Buddhism of the simultaneity of cause and effect, meaning that uh, every cause we make at every moment, every thought we think, word we speak, action we take, plants an effect in the depths of our lives, and which will manifest it itself when we encounter the appropriate circumstances. Um, the lotus flower also is known for growing in dirty, muddy swamps. Um, but as it grows uh, out of that swamp, it simultaneously helps to purify the water that it's in. So it's a, in a way, it's an important symbol in Buddhism of how even though our because of the, the muck and mud that we experience in our lives, we have the opportunity to polish ourselves and reveal our inherent Buddha nature. Um, and as we do so, because of the interconnectedness of life, we simultaneously exert a positive influence on our environment. And Kyo uh, means sutra or eternal truth uh, that permeates life in the universe. Um, the Chinese character Kyo implies the idea of a thread. Uh, so you can think in a sense of a fabric with vertical and horizontal threads, uh, perhaps uh, the horizontal threads being uh, the mundane aspects of our daily life and the vertical threads being this um, this uh, eternal truth that permeates life in the universe, uh, meaning that there's no separation between this fundamental law and the mundane reality of, 
of daily living. Um, for Nichiren Buddhists, to chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is an act of faith in the magnitude of life's inherent possibilities, in the unlimited strength of one's life. It's not a mystical phrase that brings forth supernatural power, nor is it a godlike entity transcending ourselves that we rely upon. Uh, it's the principle that honors the dignity and possibility of ordinary lives. And if you make consistent efforts, you will win. This is the practice of the Soka Gakkai. Soka Gakkai is an international lay Buddhist community based on the teachings of Nichiren and the Lotus Sutra. It was founded in Japan in 1930, and it grew and developed in the aftermath of World War II. Today, Soka Gakkai International is a worldwide Buddhist community of some 12 million members in 192 countries and territories. I believe its core philosophy is encapsulated by this statement from Daisaku Ikeda, the founding president of Soka Gakkai International. Quote, a great human revolution in a single individual will help achieve a change in the destiny of a nation and further will enable a change in the destiny of all humankind. Oops, let me go back. Uh, human revolution uh, is this idea that each of us has this unfathomable potential. And in striving to bring this forth, spurring, uh, spurred by trying circumstances and, or the desire to live more fully or responsibly, uh, we undergo a process of positive internal change that affects our family, our workplace, society, and ultimately the entire web of life. And now with that background, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on two key concepts in Buddhism, uh, non-substantiality or ku and dependent origination or the interconnectedness of all life. First, uh, ku uh, as eternity of life and death. From a Buddhist perspective, existence is eternal without beginning or end. This is true of all phenomena. From the tiniest of microbes to the largest swirling galaxies in the universe, existence is viewed as a constant recycling of life, death, and rebirth. And one analogy I like to use to describe the Buddhist view of the eternity of life and death is the relationship between oceans and waves. It's a metaphor I come to again and again. Imagine a great deep ocean, tranquil and quiet in its depths, and at the surface, waves cresting into and out of existence. Buddhism would say that the waves cresting at the surface are born and alive and decline as they fall and eventually die when they return to the greater body of the ocean. From this view, all is a cycle of flux. Buddhism would say that the waves represent manifest existence and the deep ocean represent latent existence. And both are part of a holistic phenomena of eternal existence that encompasses birth, life, decline, and death, or latent existence, and rebirth. Because of this breakdown of the strict duality of life and death, Buddhist scholars have tried to articulate the true nature of reality as ku, or neither existence nor non-existence, uh, and non-substantiality. Um, ku is also viewed as the essence of matter. Um, interestingly, you see this echoed in modern physics where attempts to discover the essence of matter have arrived at a description of the world very similar to neither existence nor non-existence. What science is telling us is that there's no actual easily identifiable thing to the basis of matter. Subatomic particles the building blocks of the physical world that we inhabit appear to oscillate between states of being and non-being. Instead of a fixed thing in a particular place, we find only shifting waves of probability. At this level, the world is actually a highly fluid and unpredictable place, essentially without substance. It is this non-substantial nature of reality that the concept of Ku tries to describe. Who is also viewed as uh, elucidating the latent potential inherent in life. 
Consider how when we're in the grip of a powerful emotion, such as anger, this expresses itself in our entire being, or glaring expression, raised voice, tensed body, and so on. Um, when our temper cools, the anger disappears. What has happened to it? We know anger still exists somewhere within us, but something causes us to feel, uh, and, until something causes us to feel angry again, we can't really find any evidence of its existence. Uh, to all intents and purposes, it has ceased to exist. Memories are another example. We are unaware of their existence until they suddenly rise into our consciousness. The rest of the time, as with our anger, they are in a state of latency or coup. They exist, and yet they do not. In the same way, uh, Buddhists view life in all its manifestations containing vast potentials and possibilities, which are not always apparent or obvious but which, given the right circumstances, can become manifest. This infinite potential is, in fact, what Buddhism views as the very nature of life. Uh, an understanding of ku is infinite is uh, infinite potential, therefore, uh, uh, helps us to see that despite how we may see the things in our environment, people, situations, relationships, or our own lives, they're not fixed, but they're dynamic, constantly changing and evolving. They're filled with latent potential which can become manifest at any time. Even the most seemingly hopeless situation has within it astounding positive possibilities. This concept has very practical importance uh, for daily living, especially when fused with an understanding of the other core concept I want to share today, dependent origination or the interconnectedness of all phenomena. Uh, Buddhism teaches that all phenomena is interrelated. Uh, through the concept of dependent origination, it holds that nothing exists in isolation, independent of other phenomena. In other words, all beings and phenomena exist or occur only because of their relationship with other beings or phenomena. Everything in the world comes into existence in response to causes and conditions. Nothing can exist in absolute independence of other things or arise of its own accord. Um a common Buddhist metaphor for this is uh, a bundle of reeds, uh, bundles of reeds, two bundles of reeds that are leaning up against each other. And because they're leaning up against each other, they're able to stand upright. But if you remove one bundle, then the other one falls. In a sense, one cannot exist without the other. Um, when we fuse this concept of dependent origination with the concept of coup or unlimited potential, it challenges us to overcome our perceived limitations for positive change in the world. Um, we don't always do this. Uh, it's very natural for us to apply various types of definitions to people and situations and ourselves uh, in order to make sense of the world. Um, but unless we're care careful about the nature of our thoughts and opinions, uh, we can easily become trapped in narrow and often negative views. He's not a very nice person, or I'm no good at relationships, or there will never be peace in the Middle East. As soon as we make up our minds about something in this way, we impose a limitation on it, shutting out the possibilities of positive growth and development. When we choose to view things in terms of coup or their infinite potential, positive potential and dependent origination, then our thoughts and actions become a constructive influence, helping to create the conditions for that potential to become a reality. Because of the intimate interconnectedness of all things, each of us at each moment has a profound impact on the shared reality of life. Uh, the way we see things has a definite defining effect on reality. Realizing this enables us to act with the confidence that we can shape reality toward positive outcomes. And with that, uh, I know that was all very abstract in a sense, but... Um, I, I also wanted to share just a little bit about what it's like to actually practice in daily life as a Soku Gakkai Nichiren Buddhist. Um, so what you see in front of you is a, an altar that uh, all practitioners have in their home. Inside of the altar is a scroll called a Gohonzun that is based on the scroll originally inscribed by Nichiren. Uh, it's what we look at when as we're chanting. It's viewed as a, an object of devotion. Um, it's often thought of as a mirror of yourself, your own enlightened self. Um, and, uh, when I chant, uh, often what's, uh, going through my mind, um, 
is my dreams or my determinations or the direction with which I want to move my life. Um, I'm also chanting for the happiness of my friends, my family. Um, I'm also chanting for the happiness of people I don't like or people who I feel maybe are causing more suffering in my life, which for me is very important because it takes me back to this core Buddhist concept of Buddha nature existing equally in the lives of all people, even people that you think uh, may be uh, dominated by evil or considered uh, evil. Um, and it, it creates the basis for universal uh, sense of dignity in all people's lives. Um, I also chant for uh, my community um, and my chanting together with others in my Buddhist community is an opportunity to meet people from many backgrounds um, and learning from each other uh, and our life experiences. One thing I take away is that uh, everybody has struggles. Uh, everybody wants to be happy. Uh, everybody has something unique they can contribute with their life. Um, and I think because of this foundation, I think it's changed the way I see the world. Um, when I'm in the grocery store and I see strangers, for example, um, my starting point is that this person is equal to me. Um, they have dignity. They want to be happy. They're struggling with some things. And they have something unique they can contribute to society. Um, I think it makes me more empathetic. Um, it helps me be, be less judgmental, uh, more quick to connect with people. Um, and I think uh, helps to uh, disrupt any type of um, unconscious biases uh, that I might carry with me. Um, and I think it helps me to try to bring out the best in other people and believe that I can bring out the best in other people because I'm confident that the Buddha nature uh, is there. Um, and I also, I think we'll just share a little bit um, uh, about my own experience. Uh, I was actually born into a family that practiced Buddhism. Um, I was always sort of around it. Uh, I always liked the people. I always liked the the philosophy of it. I thought it made sense and was very positive and affirming. One thing I didn't understand was chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Um, because for me, it seemed uh, difficult for me to wrap my hand around it rationally, how chanting did anything. Um, and um, I think uh, my general sort of mode of operation in life was that I was going to use my brain to think my way out of any problem I would ever encounter in my life. Um, and... When uh, I started to practice, it was because, uh, or I mean, when I started to practice based on my own volition, um, I, it was because I was really struggling with depression. Um, it was after I'd graduated from college, um, and the source of the depression was the fact that I was struggling with uh, being gay, or specifically being closeted as a gay man. Um, I was living with my best friends that I've known since middle school. We we're all living in our townhouse together. They're all straight. Um, and we're all, because we're living together, our lives are getting so much closer, or at least theirs were. So we're talking to each other every day, opening up to each other, seeing each other. Uh, but because I had this secret, um, I was always hesitant to open up too much. Um, and it was really killing me inside. I, in a way, I felt like um, I was not participating in that deep friendship that I saw blossoming around me. It was almost like um, looking at my life happening through a window um, that I wasn't fully participating in. Um, and my depression got to the point where I would, you know, literally sit in my room for hours and just stare at the walls and do nothing. Um, and it started to take a, a toll on my health. Um, I realized I needed to do something um, because my approach to life was obviously not working because Obviously, the more I thought about my situation to try to find a solution by thinking about it, um, the worse I felt. It was just rumination of just repeating this sort of negative, these negative thoughts and these negative feelings over and over and over again. I realized I needed something else to break me out of it. And for whatever reason, at that time, I remember chanting um, and its promise of being able to tap into these potentials within ourselves 
to break through any circumstance, any karma. Um, and although I was still skeptical, I realized I needed something. So I determined to start chanting and I started chanting. And I remember even when I first started chanting, um, I had to make a conscious effort to push the cynicism and the doubt out of my mind and just allow myself the freedom to be in a mental place where I could say, this is going to work. Absolutely. I'm not going to live like this. I'm going to change my life. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but it's going to happen. And as I chanted with that single-minded determination based on faith, um, I felt better. And I was very surprised <laughs> that I felt better because I was so inherently skeptical and cynical. Um, and whether it was something authentic or something a placebo, I didn't know, but I knew it was doing something very good for me. And with, uh, I, within about um, 12 months or so, I had managed to muster the courage to come out to all my friends, all my family, and just fundamentally change my life. And it was a very positive experience. Um, and it was an example for me of turning what felt impossible into the possible. And it made me think that I... The reason I need Nietzsche and Buddhist practice in my life is not so much to do the things that are easy for me, but to do the things that are hard for me, or might even seem impossible for me, and to fill my life with this um, sort of uh, endless source of hope and determination and confidence that uh, no matter what life presents me with, it's exactly what I need in my life in order to further my human revolution, to grow into the person I'm capable of becoming. Nothing I experience is beyond my capacity to create value from. Um, and it's uh, created a, a, a path of wisdom where I've been able to challenge myself to keep pushing and grow and learn and sort of broaden my own awareness of what I'm capable of doing in my life and find ways to break through difficulties um, that I might uh, never have done had I not sort of reached out to this thing that we call faith. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to close and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are some. Uh, but thank you for giving me this time uh, to share. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Danny, so much. I see there's there's a couple of um, comments that are in there. I don't know if you wanted to address the comments. I, I have um, a question when you're sure. done. Sure. Uh, let me see. To me, it's interesting how in Eastern Buddhism, the idea of attaining Buddhahood in this life and as bodhisattvas of the earth chanting Nami Horenge Kyo is a vow to help others achieve happiness correlate to the beliefs of attaining second comforter as an expectation for this life and to a vow or covenant uh, made that predates this world to condescend as a noble or great one to enter mortality on a rescue mission to help others attain happiness. Yeah, uh, that's true. That's sort of getting a little bit deeper into the Lotus Sutra than I, I covered. But um, yeah, there's a concept in Buddhism of a uh, bodhisattva uh, where it's a life state where uh, you're, you've sort of attained this, ability to manifest buddhahood uh but instead of entering into buddhahood into the place of nirvana and extinguishing the cycle of birth and rebirth you choose to maintain you stay as a bodhisattva so you can continue to be reborn into the world again and again and again to help others uh, develop themselves and uh further themselves along the path to buddhahood and of course in the lotus sutra um, there's even a more radical sort of understanding of this, that uh, there is no pure land that we get reborn into at the state of Buddhahood where we're no longer uh, reborn. But actually, Buddhahood is an internal state of life that has already existed with us from eternity, and we can tap into it uh, exactly as we are in this lifetime. So it's Buddhahood not as a status of attainment where you're no longer reborn into this life but it's buddhahood as a, a state of life or potentiality that exists in our lives always that we can tap into in the here and now and makes the goal of manifesting the life state of buddhahood something that is we have access to every moment 
every second of every day uh, through our thoughts and through our words uh, and through our actions. And that we practice Buddhism in order to help us manifest that state of life. Um, so I'm sorry, Jill, you had a question as well. Yeah. Well, first I want to say that I love this idea that recognizing that the delusion of separateness is the source of most of our problems. Mm. Um, but I, I do have a question because I'm mostly familiar with the Dhammapada. And as I, as I think about what I know and have learned from the study of that with how you began talking about this idea um, of how Buddhists don't really look at this um, idea of God as this, um, you know, monotheistic thing. But in the, in the Dhammapada, the gods are referenced innumerable times. Right. So I was wondering if you could kind of help me understand what the lowercase g gods from the Dhammapada um, mm -hmm. how they fit in unless it's that the lo yoga excuse me the lotus sutras um kind of have just removed that aspect yeah so um i think in the lotus sutra a lot of the ideas in the stories of buddhism including the idea of of uh deities and um, supernatural creatures that appear in stories in the buddhist texts are um internalized as states of life or experiences of life as human beings um in a sense as uh uh metaphors that help us understand how we experience existence um and the the there are some references to to gods that have influence in sort of a a pantheistic way that are often i think understood um uh more generally as uh functions of the universe or functions of of the the underlying law uh of uh the law underlying all phenomena and when we tap into that we are, are and essentially the idea is that we tap into uh this interconnectedness with the entire cosmos and that we're able to uh bring the uh uh the entire universe to in a sense to operate in the direction of our lives and our determinations moving forward in, in every single life moment and in a sense so it's like something outside of ourself like a like deity figures coming into interaction with our lives but the buddhist perspective is that we're all interconnected so the idea of self and other doesn't really exist everything is sort of viewed as as oneness um and so it's already part of our existence um but um that yeah, i think the description of deity figures is sort of helpful when we based on our sort of um comfort with sort of looking at a more dualistic way of seeing life but I think at, at the Lotus Sutra level, it's it's really understood as being just a manifestation of 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 uh, our internal state of life and our connectedness with the oneness of the universe, based on our connection with this underlying principle or law of the Dharma. Uh, I don't know if that makes if if that's helpful or makes sense. No, that's but, uh, good. Thank you so much. Okay, sure. So I see um, that there's one more question, um, a couple more things. Let's see here. Let's yeah, see. there's a comment there for you with a question attached to it, Danny. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Blah, blah. Great parallelism between the face. Thanks for sharing. I really like the story of how Buddhism helped you escape depression. Which concepts most helped you with depression aside from chanting with faith? Um, I think for me, uh, probably it's the emphasis on uh buddha nature um because you know i grew up with this belief that all people possess this buddha nature um we're all equal and we're all equally worthy of respect um and dignity and so even though i might have you know grown up and uh in many ways 
uh, feeling terrified of religion uh, when I, you know, hearing um, fire and brimstone speeches from Jerry Falwell and, and such. Um, I had these Buddhist concepts is sort of a corrective to remind me that um, I, that's not what I've been taught. I've taught that I have dignity and that my life has value. Um, and I think it helped me become more of a critical thinker, uh, I guess, because I realized that um, um, although many people believed uh, those things, I realized that uh, it just wasn't true for me. And uh, I think it helped me become um, stronger, able to sort of accept that there are people who have different views. And in fact, uh, views that are, could be very antagonistic towards me um, and then not allow it to um, define me. And it just it gave me a lot of strength, I think, to be able to just sort of cope with the challenges of daily life um, that come when um, you're different in a society that uh, sometimes doesn't celebrate differences. Um, so I would say that that was very helpful for me. Um, and there was a question, what, what I think, scripture did- I think that that w was these, so I was gonna recap here that if you have oh, questions sure. for the speakers, you can put it in the question box for the speakers. But this, this next comment looks like it was more of a chat for the audience, so. Got it, okay, sounds great. Danny, thank you so much for coming today. I really sure. appreciate it. My pleasure. It's a thank nice, you. Nice pleasure having you. So uh, again, just before I go on for the next um, speaker, I just wanted to say that you are welcome to put your questions in the question box. So um, our next speaker is Reverend Marquita Oliver. Marquita Oliver, or Reverend Mo, grew up in the Deep South the daughter of a Baptist preacher, growing up, hearing about an angry, vengeful God did not match the, the loving God she felt in her heart. So she began a lifetime quest for her own personal truth. She studied comparative religion, lived in, monastic, lived in a monastic commune, and in 1995 became ordained as an interfaith minister through the Universal Brotherhood, which is founded on the ideas that transcend geographical, cultural, and religious borders. It emphasizes the inherent, inherent unity and interconnectedness of all human beings. Marquita practices her ministry with the disenfranchised, the people who have issues with organized religion, gang members, at youth risk, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, as well as people in addiction recovery. It is Marquita's mission to go into the margins with the people who are considered disposable, without judgment or admonishment, only with love and compassion and walk her talk. I've been getting to know Marquita over the last six weeks and it's been very interesting to learn um, about some of her experiences and I can't wait to hear more about how her ministry came about. Welcome Marquita. Thank you. Ah, I am so honored to be here. I come to you from a place of complete humility, um, nervousness, not knowing. I've never done anything like this before, so I'm gonna be perfectly imperfect. So um, thank you. Um, imagine a world where we listen to each other's stories and learn we're not as different as we are the same. So take a minute, put your feet up, and I'm going to tell you a story. I was blessed to start this life as the daughter of a Baptist preacher. And what that gave me was a life of service. Um, my father showed me what service looked like. And pardon me if I'm a little hoarse. Um, and I, the thing that was hard for me as others have spoken about, was this concept of this harsh, well, first of all, the, this loving God, this God that loved me unconditionally, this God that um, wanted the best for me, this God that gave me free will, and it felt so good 
But in contrast to that was this God that was good, that was wrathful and mean and, and was going to punish me and send me to this horrid place called hell if I use that free will incorrectly. So I had this conundrum going on uh, as a child. When I was five years old, I had this experience. I was walking past a mirror in my hallway. This is so vivid in my mind. And I caught a glimpse of myself and I stopped to look at that. And as I'm looking at this strange little girl, I started to get this information and it was my whole life was laid out for me. Why I was here, that what I was looking at was what people know as Marquita, but Marquita was actually inside. This, this spirit was inside. I was here for a reason and it was a big one. And this conversation was going on inside in my heart, um, but I could hear it. It's, it's hard to explain. And my response was, I'm just a little kid. How can I possibly do this? How can I change the world? How can I? And what I heard was, I'll be with you. We'll figure it out. So I went to my mother and I told her what had happened. And I didn't know it was God. I, I didn't understand. Um, and she said, there's too much mental illness in our family. You don't tell people you're hearing voices. So I put it aside, still not understanding it, went on about my life, still being of service. And as a teenager, my service went into politics, activism. Um, I found my voice. When I was younger, I was so afraid that if I spoke, people would understand that I was odd. And as long as I was quiet, no one would know. This is another one of my, um, my fears of coming here today. It's like, oh, these people are gonna know who I am. Um, so I found my voice in politics and activism. And as I moved on through life, um, religion, I decided, eh, I'm an atheist. Religion, religion. I, I no. I'm just going to reject it all. And I went through that for a while, still doing my activism, still doing service work. And eventually, I was like, well, maybe you know, I'm in my late twenties. Maybe there is something. Maybe I'm not an atheist. Maybe I'm an agnostic. Life goes on a little bit. I grow. I learn. And it was in the study of quantum physics that I began to find God, find my way back to God. And I remembered this experience when I was a little child. And suddenly it all made sense. It's like we hear about um, in, in Matthew, in the Bible, he talks about having the faith of a child. And what is the faith of a child? It's complete trust or confidence in something or someone, not knowing complete faith. So I, I realized that this was God who spoke to me and that I was here to be of service and to change the world. But how was I supposed to do that? So I, I had this, I had this idea. I had this, what I thought knowledge, this belief that if I followed my path, if I kept my eyes open, if I kept my heart open, if I stayed awake and listened, that I could follow the path of service and that everything I needed would be provided for me as long as I followed my path and stayed awake. So I set out to do that. 
and I followed things like yellow dogs and pieces of paper and things that probably did look a little crazy to the outside world. But it was true. I never went without. Um, I didn't own a home or anything else. And sometimes I might eat beans and rice for a week, but I never went hungry. I never went without a place to sleep. And one time I ended an adventure with 37 cents, but I was always taken care of. While I was doing this, um, my very dear friend and mentor, Liz, had become ordained through the Universal Brotherhood. And she asked me to come along. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not joining any kind of religious organization. No, I'm not that kind of person. I am strictly a lone wolf. But then I met Reverend Donna, who became my mentor through the Universal Brotherhood. She had been a minister since the 60s, both with the Brotherhood and with Unity, which is more mainstream. And through uh, following with her, studying with her, listening with her, I decided to accept the calling and to be ordained. In John 15, 16, it says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. So I did it. I had a piece of paper. This piece of paper said that I could do stuff that I hadn't done before. I could marry people, which sounded like so much fun. So, of course, the first thing that came to me was a funeral. I was like, no, that's not fun. Funerals are not fun. Death is not fun. Reverend Donna said, just do it. It's You do what comes to you, and it's all going to be perfect. And it was. And I had this amazing feeling afterwards. And so began um, my ministry. In Matthew 5, 16, uh, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And he explains that his disciples are to bring light um, to the world. So I followed my light and about maybe eight years ago, by this time, my friend Liz has become an Anglican priest in Belize and um, has formed a chaplain service. And while I was there, she asked me to, to go to the uh, organization meeting, not thinking that I was going to join them, not a joiner, but just to see what was going on. While I was there, I started to feel this, this calling that I was to join. And I've always kind of been drawn to outlaws, people in prison, um, the people who, not that I'm a criminal, but people who, like me, are uh, kind of outside the norm, uh, people that aren't necessarily mainstream or see the world like this. I want to see the world like this. So I felt drawn to go into the streets, to go into the prisons, um, to go into the schools with the teenagers who might be drawn into gangs looking for kinship, looking for family, looking for acceptance. And um, that became my path. And I was actually already kind of doing that when I lived in Houston, Texas. But um, now it became like uh, more of a dedicated service. One of the most wonderful things uh, that happened during that time, there were a couple while I was doing the, the chaplain work. Uh, one is walking up into a, a group of gang members, actually wearing exactly what I am today. And they kind of looked, you know, they were having a party. They kind of looked at me like, 
you know, something doesn't look right. She's got this on, but she's got this, you know, and um, so while they're trying to figure out what this is in combat boots, walking up to them, their hearts are wide open. And while that heart is open, in goes the light. And that's the first step forward. I don't preach to people. I don't coerce people. It's not my job to scare you into being a good person. My, my purpose is to walk with the light and to bring it into the darkness so that people can see that they have a choice. And who among us has the space to carry other people's choices? Free will means we get to make our own choices. All we can do is be a light in the darkness so that hopefully others can see and make clearer and better choices. Only the soul that goes through the world with tenderness has any chance of changing it. One of my other favorite memories of um, being in Belize, and I haven't been back there since uh, the pandemic. I haven't uh, been out of the country, so I'm doing my work here. But one of my favorite memories was uh, going into the schools and they had, I had just been in uh, the service with them and there's hundreds of them and they're singing their beautiful voices. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Sorry, not a singer, but it was so beautiful. And I listened to all of these voices and then uh, they had allowed me to speak in some of the classes. So Father George led me in and I go into the classroom, classroom one. And I like to use to connect with children, uh, with teenagers, with anyone actually, um, music, spoken word, and dance. I love to dance my prayers, feel it, just feel them in my body. So he introduces me and then he leaves me alone with them. And we started talking about music and about their beautiful voices. And I told them some of my spiritual music, which is Eminem, Pharrell Williams, uh, Bob Marley. Um, and their faces started to change a little bit. I invited them to come and speak some poetry um, or their, their words. I believe every single person has a right to deliver a verse and to have their voice be heard. So they're kind of, you know, they're kind of shy, but eventually, you know, we sing, we dance, we twirl. And one young man got teary eyed and he started talking about his mother, who's a single mother and her life is hard and he comes home at the end of the day and she's just so tired and, and um, downtrodden. And we, we started to sing Bob Marley. Don't worry about a thing cause every little thing's gonna be all right. And then we all sing it together. I get kind of, um, yeah, it was really, really profound. So we all sang this together and we were all connected in that moment. When I get too full, it comes out my eyes. Um, so later in the day, Father George came to me and he said, the most amazing thing is happening. Children are singing 
out in the courtyard. And the ones that were there, I had about three classes that day. So maybe, maybe a hundred kids total. And he said the ones that were there were singing to the other kids. And it was this, it was this great light. And I've heard that all you need to do to change the world is to touch one person. So I believe on that day, I touched a person. And hopefully it made a difference in their lives. It is only through compassion that we return to ourselves and we stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. We go into the margins, margins into the fringes, not to change others, but through the very act of going, we ourselves are changed. We stand with the powerless, with the poor, and with the disenfranchised, with those that are victimized, and with those that are not given a voice until we make sure those voices are heard. Mother Teresa said, the problem with the world is we've forgotten that we belong to each other. We are so much more the same than we are different. If only we could see it, if only we could be it, if only. What I do now is I work with um, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault here where I live in Colorado. Uh, that's been a lifetime work for me. I'm an advocate for the LGBT community, specifically transgender, transgender rights. I work with people in 12-step uh, recovery. And this is, this is my practice, as well as people who have issues with God, like me, like I did. People who have issues with organized religion, not a big fan. So for me, it goes back to a story I heard when I was young. And you've probably heard it, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because I like to tell stories. A man, an old man was walking down the beach and there were thousands of starfish that had walked up on the beach, washed up on the beach. They can't walk. They had washed up on the beach. And as he's walking along, there's this young girl and she's throwing them back out to sea. And he looks at her and he says, what are you doing? There's thousands of starfish. You can't possibly save them all. What difference does it make? And she holds up one and says, it makes a difference to this one. So my goal is to go into the world one starfish at a time, one, if one person who's in a gang, who's holding guns, puts it down, picks up a microphone or finds their voice and finds a different way. One of my heroes is Father Greg Boyle, who started back in the 80s, Homeboy Industries. and. Homeboy Industries provides jobs and uh, a new life for gang members who are out of prison so that they don't have to return to the old life and um, end up back in prison to stop that cycle. And he says, nothing stops a bullet like a job. It gives them self-esteem and a kinship and a family that is not based on violence, but is based on light and love and acceptance 
and compassion and kinship. And that's, that's my goal. That's what I want in the world. And why couldn't, why couldn't God speak to a five-year-old and tell them what they were supposed to do? We hear about burning bushes and, and God comes in all sorts of ways. So why not a still small voice to a five-year-old? And if you're wondering why I wear this, because I'm not, um, I'm not an Anglican priest, I'm not Catholic. This is my equivalent of my gang colors. When I go into the streets, it tells them which side I'm on. It also says, please don't shoot me. Um, but this lets people know what I'm there for. So that's my story. And I also want to say one thing, and that is that we tend to take ourselves so seriously. And you know what? Life is too important to be taken seriously. So don't forget to laugh and love. Thank you. Thank you, Marquita. That was great. Um, I know I appreciate I, I didn't wasn't able to write the whole thing down, but you had said that only a soul that goes through life in tenderness has the power to change it. Did I get that correct? Only the soul that goes through the world with tenderness has any chance of changing it. I love that. Thank you. So I do see that you have a um a couple of um a couple of um one question at least that has come in. It says, Marquita, I've always found the uh, collapse of the quantum wave function by observation to be a godlike concept, which in quantum, um, a godlike concept in quantum physics. Which aspects of quantum physics lead you back to God? That's a big question. I, that is a deep question. I'm not a physicist. Um, it was, uh, I can't answer that question directly. Um, it was, uh, there was a study, uh, there was a movement, uh, called metaphysics back in the eighties the and through that and through, uh, quantum physics, I can't explain that. Um, all I know is that in that, in that study, I discovered, it was through science, and I've heard this before, that we find God in nature and in science more than any place else. So I can't explain exactly how that happened any more than I can explain what happened to me when I was five. It's, it's something... Um, it's something that I came to, and it, again, this has been 38 years ago, um, and I'm sorry, I can't an answer that question completely. It's something that happened to me in my heart while I was doing those studies. Okay, thank you. Marquita, thank you so much. Reverend Mo, thank you so much for coming and talking with us today. I really appreciate it. So I want to leave you with blessings for, oh, for us and for the world. So blessings, namaste, bendiciones, shalom, assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Marquita. Okay. Our next speaker, as you can see, is a duo, uh, Brian and Jennifer Bowler. Hi, guys. Brian and Jennifer grew up in Utah and met at the University of Utah. Jennifer and Brian both have bachelor's degrees from the University of Utah, and Brian has a master's degree from Grand Canyon U University. They have been learning, teaching, and building recovery programs for almost 30 years. Together, they have sought recovery and served in AA, Al-Anon, Heart to Heart, LDS 12 Steps, and other fellowship-based groups. 
They are examples of the power of good principles in healing and recovery. They believe recovery is not achieved primarily through physical and mental treatment, but through spiritual awakening and the sharing of experience, strength, and hope. Thank you so much for coming today with and sharing with us your spiritual awakening you both have discovered in your recovery. I'm familiar with the 12 steps and have found them also to be very enlightening. Uh, but then again, how can honesty, courage, integrity, humility, brotherly love, perseverance, spiritual awaken, uh, awareness, and acts of service not be enlightening, right? So thank you so much both for coming today. Go ahead. Take, a, take over. Thank you. We're going to do the tag team. Can you hear us okay? So. We can. can yep. Us? You're doing great. Uh, okay. Um, as part of the tag team, I'm going to go first, I guess. Um, we're currently in Richfield, Utah, where we just watched the solar eclipse, and it was awe-inspiring, and it was beautiful. And because that's on my mind, I wanted to say something about it. I think that eclipses suffer from the same public relations problems that snakes have. Snakes give people a very primal feeling of fear, and so they're often associated with Satan and evil and darkness. And I think that eclipses also are associated with doom and evil and darkness, particularly in uh, Western cultures or in larger cultures. And um, after watching this awe-inspiring eclipse, I think that the snake and the eclipse, maybe we should look at them a little more carefully. And maybe like the snake can also be a representation of Christ. Maybe an eclipse, the shadow of the moon crossing the sun. Um, a lot of smaller cultures like Tahiti or the Aborigines in, Ala in um, Australia or in the Philippines, they saw it as the sun and moon coming together to make love rather than an omen of dread. And so um, let, let's, let's look at the eclipse and evaluate it on its own terms rather than um, all of our cultural baggage. The, the, the scriptures of Revelation about the moon turning to sackcloth and the, moon, the sun turning to blood, those weren't eclipses. That's not what John of Patmos was talking about. Those, those were different. They, they weren't local and short. An eclipse is something different. So that's just my thoughts after watching the eclipse and enjoying it today. I um, wanted to begin my um, thoughts on the 12 steps by sharing a poem by Carolyn Pearson from her books, Beginning and Beyond, and it's called Within. And this will frame the rest of the, the things I want to talk about today. Within, I read a map once saying the kingdom of God was within me, but I never trusted such unlikely ground. I went out, I scoured the schools and libraries and chapels and temples and other people's eyes and the skies and the rocks. And I found treasures from the kingdom's treasury, but not the kingdom. Finally, I came in quiet for rest and turned on the light. And there, just like a surprise party, was all the smiling royalty, king, queen, and court. People have been locked up for less, I know, but I tell you something marvelous is bordered by this skin. I am a castle, and the kingdom of God is within. I don't think we can skip the journey of scouring the temples and libraries and other people's eyes of the world, but I think when we come down to it, our our finding God and finding the kingdom of God is something that's within the chambers of our heart and our own experience. So let's continue to look at the sunset and the sea and in other people's eyes. Let's continue to take the wisdom of the ages. Let's not forget to look with within. Um, my personal journey about spiritual growth, about life, um, was framed in a lot of ways by my husband's struggle with addictions. Addictions um, have been the bane for the human race since as long as we've been writing. One of the oldest cuneiform tablets that we have is a bewail of someone who's trying to stay away from alcohol and just can't. And that type of bondage has been part of some people's experience across the, the wet breadth and depth of this earth. And finding freedom from bondage is an important part of using our agency and of finding God and finding something better than bondage in our lives. And people have tried all kinds of different things to free themselves of bondage, all types of 
alcoholics sit around and make lots of rules for themselves. They make all sorts of things to physically block themselves or to mentally put up blocks. And some people get some sobriety and some people find some sobriety, but so many people suffer for so long. And there's, uh, for instance, the Old Testament has a back and forth relationship with, with addictions and alcohol, sometimes talking about the benefits of alcohol and sometimes talking about the dangers of drunkenness. And I think we all try and find that balance in our lives when we know that there's things that are dangerous and can give us bondage, but also there are some benefits. And I think that there was a revelatory moment back in in America in the 1930s when two drunks, Bill W. and Dr. Bob, they go by that to preserve their anonymity because anonymity is an important part of it. Two drunks decided to help one another. And they broke the process of repentance to very simple, small, emotionally centered steps. And, and I know that everyone here has probably heard of Alcoholics Anonymous and has heard of the steps and probably have thoughts and feelings and opinions on them. It's not like Al- Alcoholics Anonymous has like a public relations board that tries to manage what you think of it. it. But it has worked for many, many people. And I think that the, the litmus test of by your works, you shall know them. Finding something that can actually help with this age-old distressing problem of bondage to addictions, to bondage to things out controlling you, is, is like a light in the darkness. And it was for us. When, when Brian was in bondage and there wasn't much hope, when feelings of darkness and death and destruction was, was part of our, our daily and weekly lives, um, finding the fellowships that were offered without money and without price. I think that's one of the important things is that to 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 get sobriety is not something that's a professional go to this institution and it'll help you. It's it's people gathering together. There's there's no membership fees. They do take collections to pay the rent on wherever they rent to visit to to meet, but it's it's without paying any price. All are welcome to come and to see if it works for them. And what are these steps we're talking about? Things that we hope will work for addiction. Well, the, the first step, sorry, my paper here, is that we admitted that we are powerless. That is a step of humility and that our lives have become unmanageable. Second, to made a decision to turn our will and lives over to the care of God as we understand him. Or made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. This is the repentance part. To repent first, you have to take an inventory. Fifth, admitted to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. It's accountability. We're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. That's the invoking the power of God. Seven, humbly ask. Ask him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and become willing to make amends to them. Make real amends. That's another part of accountability. Made direct amends whenever possible, except for when to do so would injure them or others. Take our ego out of it. It's not about us. Considering other people is important. Ten, to take a personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. This is like a lifetime of, this is how to live a life. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. And 12, the, the service part, having had a spiritual waking and awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. When we started going to the, the rooms of AA and practicing these principles, Brian immediately had some relief from his bondage and suffering. But I was still in pain and sorrow and suffering. I was still in trauma from all the maladaptive things I had tried to do to manage this, this bondage. And I, I had, um, th- th- there's a saying that um, if you lie in a dog's bed, you're going to pick up fleas. And if you're around an alcoholic, you're going to pick up fleas. And I had fleas. And so even as someone who didn't personally struggle with addiction, and I didn't have a problem as my husband did, I was encouraged to practice these steps myself, to try it, just give it a try, which is something really radical. 
I think that it's really easy to think of, oh, this other person needs this thing. But to try it for ourselves was something radical. And I found some healing and fellowship and companionship. And as we practice the steps together, we found some closeness and some healing of things that we weren't sure could be healed. Some things that we weren't sure we could rebuild like trust and faith in one another. And um, those are things you can't get by force or willpower, but through repentance, which can be engendered in working steps like this of admitting our mistakes and of serving one another, of practicing humility and prayer and meditation, those things that become a lifestyle. And that way of life brought the spirit back to us and brought us um, something that we really needed. Um, there's some wonderful things that are available without money and without price, freely to all that want to. You don't need to be in Alcoholics Anonymous to practice a mindfulness way of living that practices repentance in your daily walk, that practices that accountability in our daily walk. Um, AA has a very specific way of practicing these things because it's coming into a place where people are in trauma and pain. But once once you've gone through the steps once, it becomes part of you. And I think that whether you struggle with addiction or not, whether you, whether your problem is alcohol or drugs or anything else that is haunting you, a problem that comes up again and again and again, I suggest perhaps giving this a try. How, however the spirit leads you to try to live in this way. It's, it harnesses empathy. It's a practical repentance. Service is modeled and given, and the hope is tangible. And that's one of the, the blessings that we have received through this pathway that has been unusual, but has given us blessings that we never saw at the beginning. And thank you for letting me share this. And I think I'll turn the time over to my sweetheart. <laughs> I'll just take a few minutes. Um, I just, uh, a few things that I was, as I was listening to everybody else, I, I found, uh, I'm just going to focus on a couple ideas um, that I found resonate, was resonating with me. When I was younger, I was always searching for God and, and to understand, I mean, it was, I understood him as the Savior of Jesus Christ and as um, our Heavenly Father. And, and, and so I always wanted to be, to follow him. And I, I, found, I found that uh, late, uh, I made a point in my life where I said, ask him i gave him carte blanche i said whatever you need to do in my life to uh, whatever experiences i needed to go through whatever i had to to have to be an instrument in his hand i wanted to serve others i wanted to be able to to reach them and uh, funny funny way of answering a prayer <laughs> but years later i um found myself uh, about a decade plus later I, I found myself in in the throes of addictions uh, of uh, pornography and of, of uh, other uh, substances and and I exp it was experiencing the powerlessness of of being kind of trapped in your own body somewhat and seeing yourself do things that you never imagined or go places and and then and so I needed him. I needed power to change. I had grew up in the LDS church and I was doing everything I was supposed to do. I was listening to talking to my, my bishop. To, I was really good at, at doing everything I was asked to do, but I, I kept on struggling. Um, and I, I was wondering is like if I was feeling like I was... Uh, there's a, there's a phrase in AA they call terminal uniqueness where we always feel like we're so different from everybody else. And I felt like, well, I, I had all this knowledge as going into psychology, I, psychology, I'd studied so many different things. I should know better. I should have power over this stuff, but I, but I didn't. Um, and so that lack of power, uh, you know, eventually led me when I came into the rooms of AA, I was pretty broken. Jennifer used a, a, a word called hope. She was talking about hope. 
I asked her, what did, in summary, she said, when I asked her, what did coming into recovery mean for her? And she said it gave her hope again because she saw us. We were at a, such a, a low state that um, we needed something greater than ourselves. And uh, and I still understood that as a savior. And I was going through this difficulty of trying to all these different institutions and different ideas. And yet still, I wasn't getting better. Um, ironically, when I came into a, I started focusing, there's a chapter to the agnostics. And and, and I, I, I actually did want to read it at first because mm-hmm. I'm not an agnostic. I'm, you know, I know God. I got it all. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I didn't know God. <laughs> you look at my life. It's like, well, it, there was, there was <laughs> big mm-hmm. gaps there, you know? So I started reading this chapter and it, and it, I realized our, it talked about our dilemmas that we needed him. And, and there was another thing too. I, I noticed uh, my ideas of the nature of God. Cause I, with all these things I've been listening to, I kept on thinking every one of us is trying to understand this power, greater something outside of ourselves, this, these be, this being, you know, we're trying to understand that the nature of that. And that's what I was still trying to understand and, um, and lacked. And so this, and, and I was scared to death. I was going to die terminally unique. And it, um, but they showed me a few things It's like Jennifer just shared the steps, but there was this thing called, uh, they said, here's the how of the program, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness and again i i always thought i got this down no but well no i don't i was like, very dishonest at time i my mind was closed to a lot of things because i thought i had to figure it out and there was a, a willingness i thought i had knew what willingness meant but i i had a a good uh, messenger <laughs> messenger talk to me about willingness because i was so committed to changing but I realized the willingness was just, it was more about the heart, opening my heart up and not saying I had this ego that I had it all figured out, but being willing to try things. Those concepts helped me open back up again and find hope because I was at a point where I, I just, I had wanted to die, but I didn't know because I didn't know how I'd ever get through this. Um, and I found in, in these rooms, I, I what's interesting, and I had felt God talking to me, uh, all the encouraging me, but I often would go to everybody else. And I had an experience where eventually, literally, this voice said to me, because I was I had made a mistake again, I was trying to figure out how to fix it, you know, <laughs> on, and this, and as I was thinking, it came in my mind, when are you going to come to me first? And it broke my heart because I, I knew I was, I didn't trust him. All this religion I grew up with, uh, Mormon and believing in this, reading everything, I didn't trust him. I was trying to make everything better out there instead of going to him because I was afraid that he would ask me to do something that I didn't want to do. I was always afraid of that. They, in our religion, they have this uh, Abrahamic sacrifice they talk about. And so I was always afraid of that um, and other things. So anyway, these uh, in, in, in closing, what I found was that there's AA had these cycles of with everything else of restoration and growth uh, versus atrophy that we had to find a, a spiritual connection because otherwise we would by default fall back into our old ways and and if we did so for some of us that would very likely mean death and what i also found was sacred space the first one the first meetings i came into people prayed at the beginning and you're supposed to <laughs> I remember they prayed at the beginning the lord's prayer and we set our voices together because we used to do that in a place called the temple that's where there was his church and I would I'd love that and I was not worthy to go there anymore. But I went to this place and we got in a circle and it was the same voices all together. It reminded me of him. And uh, 
these prayer circles helped me to, uh, to feel like I wasn't so unique, that I had a chance, that God, what I realized that, and because God was a bad word to a lot of people, and I, there was a lot of misunderstandings, and I won't get into that, but um, I just, I I realized this was a place that he was working in many different places, just like this conference is about that there's so many ways that he's trying to reach our our souls, our minds. And in closing, uh, I, I was grateful for just to be able to pray when I didn't, because I, I didn't feel worthy. I was told I wasn't worthy to pray with others. And I was able to be in a circle and pray and hear each other's voices repeat the same words. And it had so much effect on me. Anyway, that's that's our story. That's uh, I'm just encourage people to to look at the twelve. Uh, one thing that really helped me when I AA when I first came in there, I was like, oh, I'm not an alcoholic, but I realized quickly I was powerless, and I was able to to see what the principles meant. And and so I was um, I was aware that our minds always are making us think, oh, I'm different than this other person. That doesn't apply to me. But I learned that I was like, wait, that applies to me. That could apply to me. And that really helped me. So that's our story. I hope that, I don't know if there's any questions or anything, but um, I'm here because uh, the, the enlightenment I need was to save my life and to save our lives. So, Thank you, Brian and Jennifer, so much for sharing. Um, it, let's see, it does look like something came in. Let me look here. Oh, I think it's just a comment. Yeah, it looks like it's just a comment. Okay, thank you guys so much. I know it's kind of nice in this rainy day in the East to hear about being able to see the eclipse since we didn't get to participate in it out here. But thank you for sharing everything. I really appreciate it. Thank okay, you. our next speaker. Um, is Denver Snuffer. Um, it's so funny. I think I've tossed it. Just a second. Yeah, I did. I just lost my intro. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I have half of it. It says he was in, um, an instructor of graduate institute classes at the University of Utah College of Law for two years, as well as BYU education week for three years. He's an author of many books, including The Second Comforter, Conversing with the Lord Through the Veil, Preserving the Restoration, and numerous others. An avid, an avid historian, he has written extensively on such topics as Joseph Smith, the Book of Abraham, and Forgotten Ordin Ordinances. He and his wife, Stephanie, are the parents of nine children. Thank you, Denver, for coming and speaking with us today. I know I have found immense treasures in all of the books you have written, and they are truly filled with truth and light. So, Thank you, and we'll just leave the floor for you. And thank you for losing the introduction. <laughs> I uh, I find those kinds of things a little embarrassing. One of the comments that Brian Bola just made about prayer circles, that, that's a practice that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints participate in in the, the temples that they build. And uh, at one point, when you get through the uh, process of the temple and the ceremony is wrapping up, there's a symbol that gets discussed. And um, it's, a, uh, it's a symbol that represents uh, according to the lecture given, all truth can be circumscribed into one great whole, whole, W-H-O-L-E, not H-O-L-E, although given where society is right now, <laughs> all the truths may as well go into a whole. But the truth that can be circumscribed into one great um, connection is really represented, I think, well by the, the comments that were made in um, the earlier presenters. The truths that you discover at the highest level of the teachings of Hinduism 
and at the highest level of Buddhism uh, and at the highest levels of the, the Christian experience all merge into um, a kind of singular harmonious whole that, um, that agrees with one another across the religions. The problem is that um, uh, our um, Marquita was talking about how she doesn't like organized religion. The pr problem with organizing religion into uh, entities, no matter what form that entity takes, is that it, it very often then has jealousy for itself and defensiveness against anything that would be viewed as a rival. The religion that I believe in was founded by a prophet who claimed God had visited with him and enlightened him. And one of the proclamations that he made in defining what it was he believed was that all truth belonged to that religion, no matter where it came from. Um, the traditional form that Mormonism is regarded to have assumed is in a corporate entity called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But that institution has renounced the name Mormon, and they no longer claim that they are Mormon. In fact, um, the leader of that church says that whenever the term Mormon gets used that's a victory for the devil and i am a mormon uh the founder uh the prophet founder defined mormonism as more good and the religion consists of all truth no matter where it can be found and i think that's a welcoming proposition where if you can find truth out there then that's what we believe. That's what I believe. That's what my religion consists of. Whatever truth can be found. The theme of this conference is sacred beliefs and holy writings. And those, in my view, are two separate things. Not all sacred beliefs are contained in holy writings, nor does holy writings contain fully the sacred beliefs. Texts that I regard as uh, holy writing demonstrate the dichotomy between these two things. This is from a passage in a book called Alma. It is given unto many to know the mysteries of the God. Nevertheless, they're laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of his word, which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which they give unto him. And therefore he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God in full. And they that will harden their hearts to them is given the lesser portion of the word until they know nothing concerning his mysteries. Then they're taken captive by the devil and led by his will down to destruction. Now this is what is meant by the chains of hell. Another way of stating that is, if you ignore light and truth, you, you get less light and truth, and eventually you fall into darkness. And that darkness, that misery, that um, hopelessness is hell happens here and it happens now. It is hell. That same concept that you, you have more understanding or you have less understanding, but that there are limits to what you are able to share in mortality shows up in the New Testament writings of St. Paul. Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians about a person we all think he's referring to himself but he's not identifying himself as the person who was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will, will I form. The idea that there is something 
that um, God can reveal, but that man cannot talk about, is embedded uh, throughout the scripture. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, and Sidney Rigdon were shown a vision of what will go on in eternity. And they end that description of what they saw with this. But great and marvelous are the works of the Lord and the mysteries of his kingdom, which he showed unto us, which surpasseth all understanding in glory and in might and in dominion, which he commanded us, we should not write while we were yet in the spirit and are not lawful for men to utter. Neither is man capable to make them known for they're only to be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Ghost which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him, to whom he grants this privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves, that through the power and manifestation of the Spirit, while in the flesh, they may be able to bear his presence in the world of glory. See, there are some things about the highest form of religious experience, which are intended to be shared between you and God alone. Religion can have sacred beliefs and religion can have holy writings, but the holy writings often tell you about the sacred experiences that those that pursued the path received going along the way in which they encountered God. Religion is intended to bring us to encounter God, whether that is in the least dramatic form of feeling yourself closer to him, or more dramatic forms in which sudden bursts of clarity and understanding come overwhelming the mind, or a voice speaking to you that comes out of nowhere that that informs you of some great answer to a dilemma that you've been looking for or an angelic visitor who comes from another dimension that steps into this dimension to speak to you and to make themselves known and visible to you or the experience of being caught up as paul writes about into heaven and seeing and hearing unspeakable things. Everywhere along that continuum, there is a connection that happens between the individual and God. And that's what religion and sacred writings are intended to cause to happen. Institutions that interfere with that process by claiming that they are a substitute for the experience of a living, breathing um presence of God in your daily experience are really uh, substituting themselves like an idol to become a false image, a, a false messiah, a deceiver, if you will. Enlightenment should be experiential in that you go through it, and it should be shared universally. Nephite disciples recorded in the Book of Mormon and many of them saw and heard unspeakable things which are not lawful to be written. God wants to tell them to you. He doesn't want someone else to. He wants to tell them to you. Three of the Nephite disciples reported about their experience. And behold, the heavens were open and they were caught up into heaven and saw and heard unspeakable things. And it was forbidden them that they should utter. Neither was it given unto them power that they could utter, the things which they saw and heard. And whether they were in the body or out of the body, they could not tell, for it did not seem unto them like a transfiguration of them, that they were changed from this body of flesh into an immortal state, that they could behold the things of God. Your sacred beliefs, based upon holy writings, point you to something that is ineffable, and intended to be personal, and intended to be shared between you and God alone. 
Nephi saw a vision at the beginning of the Book of Mormon in which he saw the unfolding of history down through the end. But he was instructed by the angel who was his um, uh, accompanier on the uh, journey. But the things which thou shalt, thou shalt see hereafter, thou shalt not write. We should all have experiences that lead us to a familiarity and an intimacy that we share between ourselves and God alone. And I do want to comment on the eclipse um, as um, we heard about the eclipse that it, that it like a snake, it gets a bad reputation. Oddly enough, the snake is not, um, is not originally a, uh, a symbol of the deceiver or the, uh, the adversary. Originally, it was a symbol of God. Um, in order to mislead in the, in the myth of Adam and Eve, in order to mislead them, the adversary assumed the form of the snake, which was a symbol of uh, renewal of life, shedding the skin, uh, rising from the grave, eternal life, uh, co-opted that and turned it into um, the source of temptation and ultimately uh, transgression against God and expulsion from the Garden of Eden. But it wasn't always so. I do think that we're in the midst of a series of eclipses that hold some um, communicative value from on high. The one that happened in 2017 and the one that happens in uh, 2024 next year are total eclipses. I think the total eclipse um, brings together a symbol of both the father and the mother. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them, is um, a statement at the very beginning of the account of God's dealing with this world in the book of Genesis found in the Bible. The, the image of God, therefore, is both the man and the woman. The, the sun is uh, many times larger than the moon, but the moon is many times closer than the sun. And from the surface of the earth, the two occupy the same space in the, um, in the vision field that we have from the surface of the earth looking up. Well, when the sun and the moon in an eclipse are, are a totality, a total eclipse, then you see neither the sun nor the moon. You can see the one and the other joining together, but at the moment of the eclipse, they're both blotted out. Today's eclipse was an annular eclipse, which is unlike a total in that this one is called a ring of fire. Because the ring of fire uh, leaves you still with um, the ring of the, the, the glory of the sun exposed, but the presence of the moon uh, there, I think today's um, eclipse, unlike the one in 2017 and 2024, represents an agreement between both the divine uh, father and the divine mother, the image of God, uh, striking an agreement. And um, I think you have to view the, um, the first eclipse and the, in 2017 and the second in 2024 as conveying a message and today's eclipse signifying that the two of them are in agreement about that message. And I think that um, I'll speak more about that when we get to um, a conference uh, in April of 2024. For today, um, I do think that we have heard from people a consistent message that there is truth, it does matter that you can you can take the Hindu uh, teachings and look at the message of Christ, and you can find that uh, what Christ is talking about and what um, the highest level of values in Hinduism represent can be found there. The um, idea of uh, awakening in Buddhism and the illusion of separation and the presence of 
um, God in us all is one of the themes in the talk given by a King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon, where he talks about how God is within every one of us, that God is sustaining us from moment to moment by lending us breath so that we can live and move and have our being, and that um, we are all connected because we're here borrowing power from God to be here, and that same God who sustains us all, therefore, we have in common. Our separation is a, um, an illusion. And there is a constant recycling of existence that we, we read about in uh, the prophecies of Joseph Smith, about how this process continues worlds without end, and how we go from exaltation to exaltation until we attain ultimately to a point where we secure the resurrection from the dead and we're no longer um, needing to go through endless cycles of existence. I agree with uh, what um, Marquita had said, that we are not as different as we are the same. The problem is we tend not to notice our similarities. We tend instead to only reject by noticing our differences. And one thing I noted before the schedule was put out was that we intended to end at 1245. And I think it's discourteous to, to, to go on uh, and require people more time than they've allotted for this. So I intend to wrap up now. I don't think there's any questions for me. And um, I'll turn it back over to you, Jill. Thank you, Denver. I appreciate that. Okay, well, that's all we have time for today. I hope that uh, everybody had a chance to hear something beautiful and that they had a good time. If you or someone you know would like to join us next year, please reach out with their information and I will get in contact with them for an invite. You can reach me at uh, unityinhumanitycelebration at gmail.com. I'd like to thank everyone who helped support this conference this year and give a special thanks to Chris Van Kampen in Japan who helped with the social media advertising and promotions. Josh Maskovich, who um, is in Laos, who helped with my Zoom meeting today and with Adrian Larson, for Adrian Larson in Idaho. Um, thanks everybody for helping this all come together and I'm looking forward to seeing you next year. Question? Sure, go ahead. Oh, I just noticed there's a question on uh, in the Q and A. I don't know if you want. Oh, um, I don't know. Let me take a look. Yep, I do. I do see that there is something here. Um, Denver, there is a question that came up Any in the um, question thread. Would you like to take a look at that or do you want me to read it to you? Um, many of the panelists explained explicitly to a degree what their particular spiritual practices, prayers, mantras look like. Could you share some light into how you pray? Um, yeah, well, um, this is what I would say. Uh, it's different now than it was at the beginning. At the beginning, uh, prayer seemed um, the, the 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 same sort of thing that one would see in a in a Christian church or in a Mormon church or in a in a, a Catholic thing. Um, I didn't use rote prayers. I I used um, the kind of formal language of prayer, and very often it had. It had um, the same elements that you would think of in a normal uh, prayer setting. You address God, you, you articulate what it is you're looking for. Um, that has changed over time. And uh, while I still will on occasion engage in something that is akin to that, very often I reflect upon the things of God all the time. That's where my mind goes continually. It's it's not that I am constantly in a state of prayer, but I will be um, 
aware of the the presence and involvement of God in things that are going on and will take time to uh, reflect upon and to, to meditate upon uh, things that involve God and truth, uh, creation. Um, yesterday, uh, my wife and I were on a hike and I was, I was reflecting again out loud about how in both um, the, uh, the revelations of Joseph Smith and in the book of Revelation itself, there will come a point at which time is no more. There will, there will be a point at the end of this creation when, when time ceases to exist in the way in which we encounter time. And at that point, there is time no more. And so if we continue our existence on into that state, and there's timeless, timelessness there, then we're already there. I mean, we will, we will move into that condition. But since that condition is in itself timeless, that timeless existence already exists, even though I'm here in time. There's a, a notion in the Egyptian religion about the Ka and the Ba, the Ka being you in an eternal sense and the Ba being you here in mortality. And you both exist in both places at one time and that, that there's no difference between the two. And the objective is to try to get in touch with your eternal self. And there are echoes of that within the, um, within the scriptures that I regard as, as sacred writings or holy writings and reflecting on that and, and trying to push that um, theoretical concept back further is a kind of meditative uh, enterprise that is, in my view, a form of prayer, a form of reflection. And I, I engage in a lot of that a lot of the time and there's not a clear distinction between the prayer life on the one hand and the daily existence on the other hand. Um, there's a passage in the uh, Book of Alma about how you ought, to, you ought to pray, and he starts at a distant spot in your fields and over your crops, and he, he, he talks about prayer, and he mentions place after place where prayer should take place, and then it ends with the proximity getting closer and closer until finally you're alone in your closet at home and you're praying. And I, that alone in your closet at home, I don't view as merely um, uh, physical. I view it also as when you're alone in your thoughts, when, when you can, by meditative practice, exclude everything there is here and to take into account your relationship uh, to God, you can go to your closet in secret prayer. And I think now uh, prayer is more of a, a constant phenomenon um, and not a, um, a, uh, an event to be scheduled and to be uh, set apart. I can pray, I can pray even while I'm in a meeting like this or when I'm talking as I am now. <laughs> so it's changed over time. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this other thing that popped up is just a comment. So, all right. Thank you, Denver, for your time. And uh, Josh, whenever you're ready, we can stop recording, but um, we can turn on everybody's microphones. If anyone wants to share, 